Good morning. Please be seated. Good morning. I'm Chancellor Phil DiStefano, and I'm pleased we could gather this morning for this important event. Thank you all for coming. Respectful discussions and sharing viewpoints are at the heart of higher education, and it's what a college campus is all about. This is an important opportunity for our campus community to hear from Mark Kennedy, the finalist for the University of Colorado president, and to ask him our questions. His full resume is on the presidential search website at cu.edu. Before I bring out Mark and uh, Chair of our Board of Regents, Sue, uh, Sue Sharkey, I want to introduce regents who are in the audience. Uh, Regent uh, Vice Chair Jack Kroll, Regent Heidi Ganahl, Regent Glenn Gallegos, Regent Leslie Smith, and Regent Linda Shoemaker. Mark will start by speaking for five to seven minutes about himself and why he wants to be the next president of the University of Colorado. Our chair, Sue Sharkey, chair of the Board of Regents, is here to facilitate the question and answer period. She will begin by asking a few questions that have been submitted in advance from members of our campus community. Many questions were submitted in advance, and Regent Sharkey will begin by asking Mark some of the top questions submitted, and then she will go to your questions. There will be a staff member holding a microphone in the audience, and they will meet you in the aisle so that you can ask your question. To maximize the number of questions Mark can answer, Questions should be directed to Mark about his qualifications rather than to Regent Sharkey about the process. After today's open forum, I encourage you to complete the feedback form on the website at cu.edu. Your feedback is vitally important and it will be provided directly to the Board of Regents before it makes any final decision. I ask that we conduct this forum in the spirit of respect and open inquiry that defines us as a university community. Now I'd like to introduce Regent Sue Sharkey and Mark Kennedy. We're gonna start out uh, this morning um, first of all, by welcoming both um, our president finalist, Mark Kennedy, but most of all, I want to welcome all of you here today that take the time from, I know, very uh, busy schedules to learn more about Mark, and this is an important process. And I'd also like to um, encourage you um, to read more about the process an email went out earlier this week to faculty, to students, and to the staff explaining the, the search from the beginning to where we are now. So I would encourage you to read that and, and understand more about that process. And like Chancellor DiStefano said, I will be asking Mark three questions, and those questions I have not seen myself, and neither has Mark. So we'll, um, we'll get started with that now. Um, and oh, also, you know, I, I'm sorry. I'd like to give Mark about five to seven minutes just to talk a little bit about himself and why he would like to be the president of the University of Colorado. Thank you, Chair Sharkey. Thanks, everybody, for being here involved in this very important decision-making process. It's my honor to be the region's finalist. This is the flagship of the CU system, but I believe it's the flagship of the Mountain West. And it's an honor for me to be considered to be the president of this system. I begin my life picking strawberries, washing dishes at a bakery, pumping gas at a bait shop to be the first boy in my family to graduate from college. The opportunities that are unlocked for me animate me to be here in higher education and open up more opportunities for others. I went on to be treasurer of Macy's, U.S. congressman, 
presidential trade advisor under both Bush and Obama, as well as teaching at Johns Hopkins, leading a school at George Washington University, and now leading the University of North Dakota. None of that would have happened without that college of education. None of that would have happened had I not had a strong, firm liberal arts base at my education. When you lead an organization as complex as CU system, you need somebody with academic, business, and political skills. When I was at Pillsbury, I helped them buy haagen and spread it around the world. At Macy's, I was part of a team at an organization as big as any in Colorado that helped craft them towards a strategy of being the top department store retailer in the country. When I went to Congress, I went from managing budgets in the tens of billions to the trillions. And I only got to Congress by building a coalition broad enough to overcome the one in a hundred odds of defeating an incumbent. I did that by not only reaching out to my own party, but reaching out to independents and reaching out to those of the other party. In academia, I learned from the bottoms up. And I found that teaching at Johns Hopkins may be a better school leader at George Washington University. And leading a school at George Washington made me a better president at University of North Dakota. And I firmly believe that having led a system will allow me to be a more effective leader of the system here at CU. In, at UND, even though we faced a near 30% reduction in state funding and a two-decade logo controversy, I still unified the community to be focused on an animating strategy that increased the four-year graduation by 10 percentage points in three years, that saw a jump in research expenditure, that saw hundreds of millions of dollars of investment in our campus, much of it privately funded, to be on a path to have our largest fundraising year ever, to create new protections for sexual orientation, gender identity, and political belief, and to be amongst the top 25 most innovative universities in the nation, according to US News. So I have a proven track record of unifying communities towards a common vision, research universities, and driving that innovation. What drives me? What drives me is that my central belief is that life is a game of addition, not subtraction, that we achieve more by collaborating and multiplying our efforts rather than descending into division. And if you look at my track record, both my bipartisan track record in Congress and my 35 years experience in business and academia, where I've checked my own beliefs at the door and checked my own values at the door, not imposed my beliefs on others and embraced a collaborative approach. One thing I want to make clear from the beginning, that under my leadership, we will not go backwards as it relates to the benefits and the protections uh, for our diverse communities. If you look at my experience when I left GW and if I leave UND, I will have left the leadership more diverse as it relates to gender, race, and sexual orientation than when I got there. I am fully committed to making sure that all of our faculty, staff, and students, and the broader community have my full support and my respect for their dignity, no matter who they love or how they identify themselves. And I have reached out to One Colorado to have them be an advisor to make sure that we keep CU at the leadership of being the most exclusive system, the most, exclu exclu the most inclusive <laughs> campus. the most inclusive the most inclusive campus the most inclusive campus in academia we also not only need to make sure that we are supporting our our uh, diverse communities on campus but attracting more here because if you think about the first generation college grad that I benefited from being, most of those, many of those are in our diverse communities. We need to have an aggressive approach to reach out to them, not just with uh, making sure that we give them affirmative action and the programs that need that support that are coming from the bottoms up, but that we have affirmative outreach to make sure that we're having the financial aid to help bring them in 
and the reaching out and the recruiting process to make sure they're here. So what can you expect from me? You can expect for me to focus on the four priorities that the regents have set forth. That is fiscal sustainability. Much of my time will be spent raising money, will be, whether that be from the state government, the federal government, or donors. The second is keeping this affordable and accessible. That's not just to the traditional coming out of high school students, but to the single, the single mom wanting to, the single mom wanting to advance her to career or the 53-year-old laid off worker looking for a new path to make sure we're focused on student success, working with the chancellor and the team to increase graduation rates, and the fourth, to elevate the impact of our research and economic impact. So I'm looking to bring the broader state together to make the case for higher education. I'll be a champion of research. When I was young, our generation was enthused by one of my leaders, John F. Kennedy, who got us the focus to put a man on the moon. If I am honored to be affirmed as your leader, I commit to work in a collaborative fashion to help all of our students achieve their personal moonshots, whatever their dream might be, and to help our faculty advance new frontiers to increase the impact of our research, as well as elevate CU amongst the world's greatest universities. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. <clears throat> Mark, Mark, thank you. I appreciate that that um, giving us a chance to get to know you a little bit better. And now I want to start by asking the first of the three questions that have been submitted um, from the university community. So the first question is this, what have you done to promote and increase diversity in the past? And would you do that at the University of Colorado? And then please list specific actions you would take. So. So first of all, uh, uh, if you look at what I did in Congress, I had multiple votes to make sure that we were treating our immigrants in a respectful way, whether it being voting against having hospitals have to turn over records for undocumented immigrants before they provided care, making sure that we allowed them to use matricula cards for Mexico, making sure that uh, I voted to lower whatever the penalties were for being in the country undocumented and extend the period for which they could be here. If you look at what we've done at the University of North Dakota, when the community came together to create a strategic plan, they started out by coming up with core values. Two of those core values were this diversity and inclusivity. And then when we had seven goals, one of those is diversity. One of the things we're focused on is to make sure that we not only were bringing in as many diverse students as we were any other population, but making sure that they were graduating. So one of the things that I get as a regular report every month is every, every uh, period is how are we improving our graduation rate, but by every demographic category that is uh, reported in iPads to make sure that we are bringing them up towards that path of graduating. Um, I would suggest that diversity needs to be one of the system goals that we set out goals to make sure that we are becoming more diverse, not just as a student body, but what are the strategies we have for staff and faculty? Because one of the key things that I focused on is increasing the diversity of the leadership. Because they not only want to have diverse students here on campus, but they want to see themselves in the leadership. So uh, bringing that greater level of diversity at uh, both GW and UND has been a key focus of mine. Uh, and I would look forward to doing the same here. If you look at the leadership at, at uh, UND, I, I have brought in our first uh, African-American member of our leadership team, uh, as well as making sure that we've promoted those, uh, an Asian woman and a Muslim man to higher uh, ranks within academia and attracted uh, deans and others from a very diverse population. It will be a key focus of mine at the leadership of both the system as well as encouraging that at the campus level. Okay, terrific. Okay, <clears throat> tell, us, tell us how you made difficult budget decisions at UND and how would you handle any future loss of funding and budget cuts at CU? So the first thing we did when we faced that very significant cut uh, was we led from the top. So we trimmed the number of officers, we trimmed the budgets at the very top of the administration the first thing, and then we made sure that as we worked through that very difficult process, 
that we were working in a collaborative fashion with the deans. Part of the reason we started the strategic plan is in my second month as president, we had a 5% in-year cut that I was forced to do across the board. If you're going to really move into the future, you just can't do across the board, which is why we launched a strategic plan, so that when we're making difficult trade-off decisions, that we're focusing on priorities and we're focusing on what we need to do to invest moving forward. The second thing we did is we got the community degree, even though we were taking a massive cut, that we needed to invest in the future. So we cut $7 million more than we were required to in order to meet the, the budget constraints that the cyclical nature of our state's economy imposed. We invested $3 million of that in research as seed money to get the flywheel rolling on research, which has led to the improvement in research we've had. And we've invested $3 million more in marketing because we were really not getting out there the good things that were happening at the University of North Dakota and to bring more students in. And the third thing we invested in is tech enablement. Because if we're going to make sure that we're delivering a wonderful student experience as well as making our staff and faculty more efficient, harnessing the power of technology is one of the things we're going to do. So those are the ways that we worked our way through significant cuts. The final thing I would say is to prevent that from having such a big impact is we have over the course of time created a 5% budget reserve in each of the colleges as well as having a budget reserve at the university level so if that ever comes again, uh, we don't have to have such a, a, a significant adjustment. Terrific, all right, okay, so the third question, what qualifications do you have to lead a large, complex, esteemed R1 university? Uh, first of all, uh, I have spent much of my life at the scale of CU. My business career was most of it at organizations larger and perhaps, I don't know if anything's more complex than higher ed, uh, complex uh, at government when you're dealing with the scale of government and voting 700 times a year, having to focus on 700 issues, uh, those give you the experience. But UND is on its pathway uh, to be an R1. We have the same medical school, law school, uh, collaborative governance system, and I am committed to making sure that we're letting your chancellor lead your campus. We might be having shared goals, but it's going to be run here locally. Uh, and we also have athletic teams, Division I uh, athletic teams, and all those complexities that you have in higher ed that I come to this task with the familiarity of. Okay, terrific. Now that we've gotten those first three questions um, answered, I want to open up the questions to the audience. There are staff members in the aisles with microphones, and they will come to you if uh, you raise your hand. So please assist them um, when they, they come over to you to just step into the aisle. Um, okay, we'll start right here. Yes, good morning, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Ben. I am a... Dis I am a dis distinguished professor in the Department of History, and my research actually is in the state of North Dakota. Specifically, I work on the native peoples of North Dakota. So in light of that, I'd like to ask you a question about your CV. Your CV states that you, quote, met with all tribal colleges to establish two plus two finish in four programs for priority degrees. And I was surprised to find that a well-placed tribal college contact I approached in North Dakota was not aware of these meetings and speculated that the same was true of other tribal colleges. So would you please tell us the names of the people you met with and approximately when you did so and and can you clarify, can you clarify whether these so-called meetings were in fact the meet and greet encounters built into the new faculty bus tour in which you participated? Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for that question. I appreciate it. Uh, Meeting with our indigenous populations and meeting their needs is something that's uh, very important to me. And uh, I have met with several of those on our bus tour that we take across the state uh, to meet with the, uh, the various uh, tribal colleges across the state. Uh, Russ uh, Williams, I believe, leads uh, the 
uh, try, uh, try the, the technical college in Bismarck. We have also one in Devil's Lake at Spirit Lake that we met with. We've also met with the one at Newtown. Uh, all of those are our alums. We do have not two plus twos with each of the u universities because not all of those have embraced us, but we have uh, those started with one and on a path to get at a second university. So I've met with them on those bus tours and I believe on others, but also I'm the president of the university, so I also embrace the tribal universities by having my staff reach out to them and making sure that we are making sure that they are getting the recruiting efforts that we can to bring them into the university. Okay, we have a question right here. Good morning, Mr. Kennedy. My name is Olivia Wittenberg. I'm a junior here studying international affairs in Spanish, and I'm here today with CU Student Government, and this is our question to you. How do you plan to support and advocate for the students, staff, and faculty on CU's campus that might feel unwelcome or marginalized by your previous leadership record? Uh, I think the only thing I can do is to con continually reach out, understand your concerns, and make sure I'm responsive to those, to those concerns. As I've mentioned, uh, reaching out to One Colorado is a first step towards making sure that I have advisors around me that can make sure that we're doing everything we can at the CU system to encourage the whole system to be the most exclusive university system in the country <laughs> and make that... <laughs> make make this system the, it already is, if it's not already the most inclusive system in the, in the country, it should be. Okay. Where, oh, looks like we have a question there. Okay. Hi there, my name is Delaney Duskin. I'm another member of CUSG and I'm a sophomore studying political science and linguistics. Um, I don't recall the exact event or interview that it was, but you, in response to a question about serving the needs of DACA and ASSET students, you said, well, that's not a problem because there's very few, if any, DACA students at UND. The entire Colorado system has a very large population of DACA and ASSET students. So how are you planning specifically, other than having staff go and reach out to them or a bus tour, reach out and talk to DACA students and their families to serve them in higher education. Uh, making sure that we are embracing not just DACA students, but anybody that the immigration system is unfairly treating for no fault of their own will be a priority of mine. And as I've said before, not just signing letters, but speaking out nationally. I'll look forward to having in my first month or so as your president, a national publication that I try to reach out to and try to place as much as I can a very forceful argument for why we as a nation need to make sure that we're all embracing them and look forward to advocating aggressively at the federal level to make sure that we solve this immigration crisis that we've been facing for a long time as well as making sure that we are in the meantime not allowing those that are being penalized by our inability to address immigration, uh, that we're not penalizing them, but that we're giving them the support that a higher education can provide to make them be beneficial into the future. I think it is a crisis to the extent that there are people that are suffering because they have, are not giving the full benefits that they should be having if we had a more comprehensive immigration reform. Okay. Oh. My name is Bob Severs. I've taught here for 44 years. I have sent one of my students to your school as a full professor there. Sorry about this. <laughs> I um, was elected regent of the university twice. I served 12 years in that role, one of the few faculty members that have ever served as a regent. I have participated in the hiring and selection and have voted for uh, seven presidents so far. Um, all of them Republicans. I have um, 
what is the question? I'll get to it. I, I um, am concerned about several things, uh, and many of them are uh, related to principles that we have tried to adhere to through the years. <coughs> principles of shared governance, principles of free uh, inquiry. Uh, we're concerned about uh, the research that we're conducting at this campus that you would have perhaps voted against in opposing stem cell research. We're concerned about whether this uh, process is going to lead to conflicts between the legislature. Our state is now a purple state. And we've had uh, 12 successive Republicans as our uh, president in the time I have been here in 44 years. The, um, the question I have is, given that, and uh, the governor's recent uh, encouragement that you pay attention to, um, including all of us, and they didn't mean just the nine regents, they meant the faculty and the students, and they meant the legislature, which is going to have to deal with you and you with them. And so my question is, given all of these problems and the uncertainty that you see in this room, would you be willing to, if you were not selected the sole candidate, to uh, allow yourself to be compared with other deserving candidates uh, who are in the pool, we know them to be in the pool, and um, make this a more conventional, uh, normal, competitive process rather than one that is exclusively predetermined and shoved down our throats. Thank you for that question. I appreciate it. And I think there was about five questions in there, so I'll try to address all of them. First of all, as it relates to the first question, uh, I, 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 defer, I defer the selection process, which is the region selection process, to the regions. That's their decision, not my decision. Second of all, as it relates to shared governance, uh, I have a strong track record of reaching out throughout my university in a shared governance process. And uh, this strategy was put together with 900 people involved. So making sure that we are firming shared governance is something that I'm firmly committed to. Second of, third of all, as it relates to academic freedom, uh, that is the province of uh, committees in the university level, not at the system level, as to what they research, how they research it, I have a strong support for academic freedom. Nothing that I've done in the past is going to prevent me from affirming the academic freedom of what we research and how we research. Fourth of all, as it relates to freedom of expression, UND is now green according to Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. And uh, speaking to perhaps uh, the person you were referring to uh, came forth, I read it in the paper one morning, that supposedly we were not allowing uh, one of our indigenous professors to hold a conference on uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, which is very controversial in the state and controversial with many of our legislators. And I read in the paper that supposedly I knew about this, which I didn't, to which I immediately called the dean who said, what's going on here? She said, we don't have funding for this. I said, we need to find funding. We need to hold this. And not only did we hold this event, uh, addressing the indigenous concerns about Dakota Access Pipeline, but I hosted the professor and all of the speakers at the residence afterwards. Fourth of all, about the legislatures. I just, I've been to the legislature three times so far this week. I've met again with the governor and his team. The governor emphasized to me as part of the conversation that his emphasis was unity on the regents, was not a sp speaking against me, but an encouragement that for our system to move forward and be the best we can be, we need to be unified at the region's level, at the system level, and in collaboration with the campus level. 
that's why I am absolutely committed that working as hard as I can to bring these, all these pieces together so that CU can move forward to its fullest potential is my firm commitment. Uh, I defer to the regents on the selection process. Hello, my name's Deep. I'm a Colorado native, first generation student. Uh, I'm a law student. And my question is about, thank you. <laughs> my question is about um, Colorado laws. So per pupil spending for higher education, North Dakota is top 10. Colorado is bottom three. And that's mostly because of Tabor, the Gallagher Amendment, and Amendment 22. First, can you answer what you know about those amendments and how they lead to a complex budget situation? And then second, would you be willing to campaign statewide for a tax increase specifically to address higher education funding and reduce tuition? Amongst my first meetings with the legislatures is to free up the surplus that is made available that ha under Tabor is required to be distributed. And I committed to the Democratic leader that I would be a strong supporter of making sure instead of distributing that back to the taxpayers, that that be retained to be invested according to their formula, one third for higher ed. I said actually it should be more than one third for higher ed because every time things get cut, they protect K-12, they protect healthcare, and we take the brunt. So that is one example of how I am familiar with how Tabor is restricting our ability for our state government to fund. The second thing is, uh, for us to make an impact, it can't just be CU, it can't just be Mark Kennedy. I need to be reaching out to CSU, to the other college, smaller colleges, to the community colleges. I've already met with the, the, the head lobbyists for the community colleges, to the business partners that want more talent and want more discovery and have a coalition big enough to push for a greater investment in delivering the talent and the discovery that the state needs. So if that ends up being, that coalition says the thing we need is a tax cut, in or a tax increase in order to get more funding for uh, education, I will support whatever that coalition deems to be the most important way we support greater education in the state of Colorado. I'm going to be, as the leader of the lead system of education in the state, the one that pulls all those together to have a coalition. Because, again, life is a game of addition, not subtraction. We are going to be more powerful if we speak as a broader coalition as opposed to one person or one system or one campus. My name is Dana Villarreal. Um, my question is concerning your time at UND when there were multiple instances of students committing blackface and you tr chose not to do anything about it. <laughs> I'm wondering how that we can trust you will not be a bystander or an ally to racism and white supremacy on this campus. Uh, during my first week as uh, president on campus, we did have uh, the Snapchat incident that you are referring to. Uh, that immediately resulted in a protest on campus, which the first thing I did was join the protest and protest against such a treatment which is against our core values of inclusiveness and, ex and uh, diversity. Second thing I did was I immediately met with the student leaders of the group protesting to talk about some of the actions we could take to help create a more inclusive and diverse student body. The, then we deferred those decisions as to what actions you can take to a behavioral intervention team that deals with those types of uh, potential student violations. That group worked broadly with the student affected and everybody else and came back and that group had three African-American members, two of them uh, female African-American members. Uh, they told me that there was nothing we could do in order to prosecute it. Uh, and under the free speech grounds, offensive speech is offensive speech but it is protected under free speech. So consistent with that, uh, and we moved forward in that path. So if that happens here, what would you do? First of all, if that happened here, I would let the chancellor do 
what needs to happen. And uh, you, you, uh, I condemned that action uh, and I took the appropriate steps through the collaborative governance process to do what type of responsible action would be done. And those are campus level things that would be done. But I believe that the way we handled that was consistent with the, uh, the collaborative governance and free speech standards that universities are called to abide by. I believe the students. I believe the students do feel that way because we did the first ever survey across the campus of do you feel included? Do you feel safe? This was a survey they did where we had a two or three times the number of people participating that normally do in these surveys. And we found that although our, our rankings were comparable, it was an EAB survey to comparable universities, we used this survey to guide how we could be better. One of the things the survey told us is that we weren't always teaching in a manner that made all the diverse communities feels included. So we created five courses for our professors to help them understand some of the ways they could teach in a more inclusive manner. We have a question over here. We have a question over here. Good morning, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, my name is Stephen Moises. I'm a professor of geology, and it's been my honor to work at the University of Colorado for 19 years. I'm also chair of the Arts and Sciences Council, which represents uh, faculty, uh, both the tenure stream and instructor faculty in the College of Arts and Sciences. Now, there's an undercurrent that concerns me here. And the undercurrent is that, um, for example, you view it as unfair uh, for people to continue to question your congressional record. Um, this has been amply reported. Um, but uh, the votes you cast were not youthful indiscretions. Indeed, they were acts of a full-grown man, a member of Congress, who was uh, elected to lead a nation and uh, uh, based on his values. Now, even if you've fundamentally changed your views, what does it say that you've had such views so recently, for instance, as reported uh, with the Pawlenty campaign in 2012, that many of us find abhorrent um, as an adult, and you exercise them in the halls of power? And this concerns me, and it concerns many of us here on the Boulder campus. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question, and let me acknowledge that I understand there are concerns out there amongst you and many. Uh, what I would say is that if you look at my track record, nine years of track record in academia, not my six years, not alone my six years uh, a track record in my time in Congress. We have implemented a policy for protection against discrimination uh, for sexual orientation or gender identity at UND that is as strong or stronger than they have here at Colorado. We also have implemented expanded staffing to help sure that we are making the full community feel included, and we've expanded the number of support services, whether it be an ally program, a mentoring program, a welcoming program that I attended, uh, and calling in the other universities around our university to play a leadership role. So this is an area that my track record, and, and also making the leadership more diverse, uh, has shown that I have a nine-year track record that is starkly different than what you see on the voting. Let me just talk about this transformation, which is, uh, has been a journey, as it is for many. And as you know, during those times of those votes, uh, there are others that, that had that same view. But if you look at my, uh, the first two paragraphs of my book, I tell a story about as a child, I tell a story, I tell a story about it as a child uh, my, my mother would line all of us children up in the first day of school photo. And she 
took a, after we took the photo, she gave us a piece of advice, the same piece of advice every year. And that piece of advice was to look for the new kid in class, person on the edge of the classroom, on the edge of the playground, and make them fit in. And it took a while for it to sink in, but I realized that that was not what I was doing with those votes. And I have, based on that and many other experiences with friends that I have, have shown me that the love and the commitment between same gender relationships is as strong as that between traditional marriages. So I have had multiple experiences that have led me to the belief that we need to be strong advocates. And so uh, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kennedy, I have a two-part question. So the first one is um, actually goes right to your last point. Um, and in a sense, this is um, a, a character question. So I'm not interested in hearing about um, the way in which you delegated responsibility to pretty much everyone else around you. Um, you said in your opening remarks that you check your beliefs at the door. And you said that you support the LGBTQ community here um, on, at your current campus and you would here as well. Um, and I'm curious how to reconcile those two things um, and if it means that you do on some level still hold discriminatory beliefs. Um, so I'd like you to tell me uh, about your conversion. I would like you, <laughs> I, I'm very serious because as my colleague mentioned, um, your record in Congress is one that you um, did in a public way using federal power and your seat in office. And I'd like you to tell me about how you went from spending that congressional time trying to amend the Constitution to forever discriminate against gay people and their families, like myself, my wife, many of our faculty here, students, and staff. Please, please tell me how it is that you went from seeing folks like me as less than fully human, not just not realizing that their relationships were loving, but that we were in fact unworthy of constitutional protection, but now, as you say, you quote, support everyone. And I do have a follow-up, depending on your response. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, I began to talk about that conversion by talking about that experience, those, in, those values that my mother instilled on in me early that I did not fully manifest in the votes as you just described. And uh, as I reflected on that, uh, I, I've said that was a vote that I would not take today. And uh, let me just tell you about some of the other experiences though. Uh, our, our daughter, after having gone to the University of Michigan, we both ended up in Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., she would oftentimes gather her friends, and amongst her friends, uh, a good share of her friends are from the LGBTQ plus community, and I got to know a number of her friends well. The second thing is that I've had multiple uh, faculty, staff, other friends that have shown me what you are just saying, that the love and the commitment between same gender relationships and marriages can be as strong as it is in traditional marriages. The fourth thing, the fourth thing that I have found is that, and we talked about this earlier in some of the meetings here on campus, I am animated by getting more people towards a graduation and what a degree provides. And I've increasingly understood that it is not just about being able to pay the tuition. It's not just being able to pass the classes. It's about whether you feel included. And we need to make all communities feel included, have the support systems and organizations to help them feel included. All of those put together uh, have converted me to be a strong advocate and I've shown that. If you look at the, the woman that leads the diversity programs at UND has said we've made more progress in helping the community in the last two years than they did in the last decade.
Would you then now publicly apologize for having, for having campaigned and spoken and voted to shame, to diminish the dignity of your fellow humans and to commit to publicly working also outside of your job in, uh, in favor of full equality and inclusion, particularly now as we see in the Supreme Court a bill um, to permit discriminating against employees based on their um, gender expression, sexual orientation, et cetera. I would like you to publicly apologize and to denounce this platform and not simply say you regret it because it is now essentially politically expedient or because you met some gay people because there are a lot, there are a lot of gay people and there are a lot of transgender people and a lot of people who are gender non-conforming and we have students, we have faculty and com community members that see your actions as threatening and shaming. I am pained that my actions caused other pains. I apologize that my actions caused the pain that you very eloquently described. And I am, my, my reaching out to one Colorado is a step towards understanding how I can help make sure that we are reaching out to that community, but I'll be reaching out to other communities uh, to make sure that we are the inclusive campus, the standard bearer in academia. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. Uh, I just want to remind us all that in 2000 and 2006, less than 15 years ago, uh, these votes were not just votes. You co-sponsored both of the bills that would have uh, caused our Constitution to discriminate against us. Not only did you vote yay, you co-sponsored. If your strident efforts to constitutionally limit our rights had succeeded, people like myself would have been prevented from marrying the person we love, likely for the rest of our lives. Can you describe in detail how the nation would be better off today if you had been successful? And please be specific and think about if you had been successful in this leading effort that you led. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, we would not have been better off. Uh, and so uh, let me just though, tell you, I didn't lead that, although I, I'm not doubting that I co-sponsored it. Let me tell you something I led. I led a bill to invest more money in the HIV AIDS global investment that we made. And in that, I was co-introduced with Rahm Emanuel, former chief of staff for Obama and up until recently mayor of Chicago. My support for more investment during my time in Congress for HIV AIDS investment was joined by Jay Inslee, now governor of Washington, as well as Jerry Nadler, now the head of the Judiciary Committee in the House. So if you look at cases where I led, that is an area where I led in Congress and uh, we would not have been better off had we passed that bill. Hello, Mr. Kennedy. Um, thank you for being here today. I'm a conservative student leader on this campus, and as you can see, they're not very welcoming to conservatives here because of obviously what they've been doing to you today. But I know you've touched a little bit on this issue, but um, I would like to know what the sec I mean, what the First Amendment means to you and how you'll implement that on this campus. Well, I think the First Amendment here applies in several ways, but most specifically in freedom of expression. And so I think the idea that we embrace the idea to have debates on difficult issues is what we need to do. If you look at the future, nearly all of the jobs are going to be jobs that have not yet been created. So whatever skills we're training students for today are going to be less applicable than their ability to think critically. 
we have a, a digitization that is allowing multiple media outlets that everybody can have an ever narrower slice of media that reinforces their own views as opposed to challenges their thinking to think more broadly. One of the things I've done at the University of North Dakota is to start a lecture series called the Eye of the Hawk Lecture Series that goes back to Merlin converting Arthur into a hawk so that he could see that flying from above all these borders that they've been fighting wars over aren't visible with a bigger, broader perspective. So one of the things I would hope to do would be to come to each campus with people with starkly different views, preferably pulled out of the CU community, to have a conversation to help expand all of our minds as to how we can think more broadly, embrace critical thinking, be prepared for whatever the future might hold. Thank you. Morning, Mr. Kennedy. Morning, I hope you find Boulder beautiful. I hope you like the view of the Rockies from campus. So the Grand Forks Herald in North Dakota reported that you made $365,000 a year while president, as, while president of UND. How much are you expecting to make in Colorado? Uh, I would suggest that uh, uh, we'll see what the, what it is. If you look at, we do get 365, we do have a president's residence, which we very much enjoy, uh, but the compensation is not what drives me. What drives me is what it is we can do in the twin engines of my passion for higher education is having more people experience the uplift of opportunities that it provides their families and their communities to have a college degree. I am very concerned that we as a nation are falling behind in specific China in terms of investing in the technologies of the future and, and there's a place for liberal arts to play in wrestling with all those technologies, artificial intelligence, 5G communications, Internet of Things, and that if we don't advance that research that we are going to uh, not have the edge and innovation that's driven our prosperity, that's driven our security and therefore our values. So what really drives me is not the compensation, whatever it happens to be, but to deliver more opportunity to students through an education and to drive further research to keep America at the innovative edge. We have a question right here. <laughs> Uh, hello, my name is Brianna Hill. My pronouns are they, them, theirs. I am a senior studying ethnic studies. And my question is, you keep talking about benefits and support on campus. And I just would like to know what support you would give to marginalized students on campus, what benefits. I just, I, I'm a little suspect because you keep saying supports and benefits and blah, 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 blah. What, like I want real support, real benefits for students of color, for LGBTQI students, for our disabilities, like, wh what are you going to do if you get here? I'm a little suspect as I'm leaving the university. I just would like to know how you are going to support our campus, our students, our faculty, and what support, what benefits are you talking about? Because I'm listening to it and I'm like, hmm, what are they? Thank you for that question and allowing me to clarify. When I speak of benefits, I'm talking about health care, retirement benefits that anybody might have. When I talk about support, I'm talking about the support services that I expect the university here is providing to each of those communities you referred to. And when I talk about what we can do from a system perspective, I think we could, from the system perspective, debate goals and aspirations that we would hope that each uh, like what kind of diversity are you going to have amongst the leadership? Are you going to have amongst the faculty? Are you going to have amongst the staff? We have advanced uh, uh, programs in terms of mentorship, uh, ally organizations, uh, helping with academic advancement uh, at the University of North Dakota. But again, I am interviewing to be system lead. I'm not going to reach into each campus and tell them what programs they should do. I'm, I'm not 100% sure uh, I understand the question because we have health care and retirement benefits that I am supportive of. We have programs at the, at the campus level that I am supportive of. The other thing is to reach out and 
make sure that you have the financial aid in other areas to make sure other support. What about your students with blackface? What about, like, how are you going to support your students like that? Because it's happening on the CU campus. How are you going to come in and help students? Because shit like that is happening on the CU campus. So to the extent, I think one of the best ways we can do that is to the extent we're not doing a system-wide survey of do you feel safe, do you feel included. And, and, and to those extent of those surveys are pinpointing areas of improvement, I would look forward to working with the chancellors to see how we have an action plan to drive further improvement of making everybody feel included. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you very much for being here today. My name is Elizabeth Garfield, and I am a uh, representative on staff council. <laughs> Secretary DeVos has proposed sweeping changes to Title IX enforcement with regard to sexual harassment and assault on college campuses. Can you tell us which proposed provisions you support, if any, and which you oppose, if any? And could you please be specific? <laughs> <clears throat> to my understanding, this has already been uh, debated and discussed at the system level, at the regent level, and uh, not a definitive conclusion put forth. Uh, so I work with the regents to respond to federal policies like that, but let me give one specific example. Uh, that policy would require us to only provide support and protections for incidents that occurred on campus, not more broadly. We have already at the University of North Dakota decided that even if that moves forward, that says what we have to do, not what we can do. And so when I said we're not going backwards in terms of protections, I said to the greatest extent that we are permitted by whatever law comes out, we can do more than the law requires us to do, and we can reach out more broadly in terms of the support and protections than whatever the federal government requires us to do. Um, before, oh, I'm sorry. Just uh, before, one, more, one more question, one more question. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Victoria. I'm a sophomore ethnic studies major, also with a minor in leadership studies. Um, I know you've been asked about this a lot already, but I have something a little more specific pertaining to this topic. Um, so in your open letter, you stated that you evolved from your anti-same-sex marriage views during your time in Congress. And I'll give you a small hand to the things you've done at UND that you stated in your letter. But my question is, so, you know, as people and as, including politicians have become more empowered to share their racist, sexist, homophobic, et cetera, um, views over the years. Um, essentially, you know, you want to be a leader here, um, but exemplary leadership is a lot more than evolving yourself. It's also evolving others. So I want to know what have you done to evolve the politicians who voted yay with you on those amendments from 2001 to 2007? <clears throat> Again, uh, as the president of the University of Colorado, I'll be looking for input from people like One Colorado to say, how can I provide more of a leadership role on this? And I'll look forward to getting their advice as to how I can more effectively do that. I, I haven't been a politician for a long time. As the president of a university, my focus has been on what can I do within my university uh, I have not been in politics, and I don't intend to go back into politics. Thank you so much. So, Hello. The, um, can I just, I'd like to just make a comment. Um, we've gone a few minutes over, which is fine. Um, and we have lots of folks with lots of questions. So, we have gone over, and, uh, but I would like to have um, someone have the opportunity to have one more question, and then we'll be wrapping that up. Human-caused climate change is, is easily the most deadly issue ever to face the human race. Over 1,000 institutions like municipalities, churches, and universities have now divested out of fossil fuels and invested in renewable energy. Renewable energy stocks outperform gas stocks by two to one. They are increasing in value 
while oil and gas is decreasing. You've said this week that you believe in climate change and fiscal responsibility, but all, you've also said you did not support divesting. Will you please explain this contradiction? Here. <clears throat> If you look at the way that we are required to invest at the University of Colorado, we are not allowed to invest in any individual stocks. We're only allowed to <coughs> invest in mutual funds or other amalgamations. Uh, there are very few that have no energy investments in them, but there are those that do invest more in renewables. So I am going to work with the investment committees to make sure that we're trying to solve the dual goal of making sure that we are investing in the most socially responsible way we can to advance the concerns and the actions towards addressing climate change while making sure that we're fulfilling our fiduciary responsibility to have the best, safest investments for the university. So that would be my commitment to you. Let me first of all say thank you for the opportunity to exchange ideas. I would look forward to coming back in the future and engaging with you more fully. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Chancellor. So thank you all for being here. Uh, I, want, I want to encourage all of you to complete the feedback form at cu.edu. Thank you very much for being here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.